Long-term observations at Long Point Bird Observatory in Ontario, Canada corroborate patterns observed at other locations with eruptions occurring randomly throughout the years 1961 to 1987. Because numbers of birds that remain resident or move south vary considerably from year to year, it's difficult to predict the number of birds that will remain resident or winter in any given location. This year is an eruptive one for them. Red-breasted nuthatches started heading south back in mid-August. Cone crops haven't been good in the eastern boreal forest, causing them to leave in search of food. Individuals have made it as far as Oklahoma and Alabama. Given that these little guys are short-distant migrants who prefer the colder northern climate, seeing them travel so far reveals this sudden influx is not only a classic example of major food supply related to eruption, but it's also occurring unusually early in the year. For those of you with bird feeders at home, this is great news. Perhaps your feeders will be where one of these darlings will go. I'm curious to know how many of my American friends, especially in the more southern areas, have seen red-breasted nuthatches this year. Comment below, I'd love to know. So there's a few of the most searched questions on the red-breasted nuthatch answered. Was any of these questions something you've wondered? Also, I thought I should ask if you have future video idea that you would like to see. I hope you'll take the time and leave it in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching. Take care. Happy birding! I've been birding for 8 years. You would think that over that amount of time I would have seen many nests, but no, not really. I am not a typical birder. Although I started out that way, it kind of ended up taking its own path, having close relationships with various bird species. Because of that though, I've been able to get a glimpse into some of their secretive nesting world, and I want to share a few of my favorite experiences watching birds nesting. It won't all be of birds I know well, in fact two of the experiences I'm going to include are from birds I didn't have relationships with. Here they are, enjoy, and happy Mother's Day to my wonderful mom and all the other wonderful moms out there. Northern flickers are woodpeckers, and this was my second nest, almost six years ago. With these guys, I witnessed the courtship and copulation, which was adorable. Male and females look very similar, but one defining feature that separates them is the male's black mallards. Marks that start where the beak meets the face and travel down on the cheek. I find that these marks kind of look like a handlebar mustache. The male was such a funny guy. I remember one day while his mate was off doing whatever female flickers do, he stayed at the nest hole, sometimes working on it, but mostly just looking out of the hole or perched on top making his territorial call. It was funny when his mate was on the way. He popped his head back inside and started hammering, as if to make it look like he was busy at work the whole time she was gone, but I know the difference of that because I had been watching him for over an hour. Once she got there, he left and let her have a look inside. I don't know if she was impressed or not. Once the babies hatched, they both worked hard to feed them, but the females seemed to be the one out getting food the most. Or close by in a tree on lookout. It's the male that's the homebody. Funny thing was when her mate would come to the nest when she wasn't ready to leave yet. 
She kept sticking her body to the nest and the male backed off. He waited until she was ready to leave, and only then did he attempt to go back in. Don't mess with Mama when she's taking care of her babies. Their offspring successfully fledged because of their combined efforts. What a team they were. Almost six years ago, I discovered a Merlin nest by accident. Merlins are small falcons. Every morning I'd walk up the dirt path behind my house to visit my bird buddies, and one morning I heard this loud shrieking. I stopped, looked around, and after a few moments discovered a bird of prey who seemed ticked off with me. It was a female Merlin. Didn't take me long to figure out that she was nesting and that's what her problem was. Every day after, I'd visit and try to record 20 minutes or so of her and the nestlings. It was an interesting experience, my first bird of prey nest. I read up on them and discovered that merlins don't build their own nests. Instead, they use nests that were previously owned by hawks or crows. I found that pretty neat and clever, and it certainly cuts down on the time that would have been used building a nest. Mama Merlin would sit in her nest and allow me to get some recording from quite a distance away, but if I dare go an inch closer, she'd hop off the nest and lose it at me. I felt bad when that would happen. I hated upsetting her, so I'd always leave and try again the next day. No matter how much I tried to gain her trust, she'd never allow me any closer. I had to settle for what I could get, and rightfully so. These birds don't need any more stress than they already have to deal with. The babies were like little bobbleheads, typical for birds of prey. Their little white fluff made them look adorable, and especially those big yellow feet they seemed fascinated with. While Mom brooded the little ones, Dad would be out getting food for them or on watch nearby. Males are much smaller than females. This distinct difference in size is known as sexual dimorphism, which is common in birds of prey. But in the case of non-predatory birds, it's the opposite. The males are bigger than females. It may be this way for predatory birds because it protects females from aggressive males that are well equipped with sharp talons and beaks and the killer instincts that go with them. Another explanation is to allow the two sexes to hunt different prey and thus reduce competition for food. One thing that seemed quite apparent to me though was just how fierce the female was compared with the male when it came to protecting their young. I also rarely saw the male but the female was always on or near the nest. So since she's the one there the majority of the time, maybe her size helps to defend her babies from larger predators such as other birds of prey. But that's just a thought. I could be wrong. It does make sense to me, though. I mean, that female had no fear of me. Which wasn't the case with the male. What a good mama she was. And I'm pretty sure that the next spring she returned and remembered me. This was her. She allowed me to get so close. I'd like to think that she did remember me, but more importantly, that I didn't cause her babies any harm, especially when they fledged. She actually allowed me to be around them after a few days of fledging. So maybe she was cool with me now. Who knows, just a sweet thought. I've come close to seeing chickadee nests before, but it always ended up with the pair deciding against the nest and trying somewhere else, which I was unable to find. Last year, though, I finally found one. It belonged to my sweet little Tani and her lovely mate Tim. I missed the building of it and found it when the babies were already hatched. Tani and Tim worked extremely hard to bring food to the babies and defend the nest, too. A delightful experience watching these two sweethearts work together to raise their young. What a great job they did. They would even take breaks with me to eat as I watched nearby. <laughs> T 
Connie put so much care into her babies. She was a wonderful mom, and Tim was a wonderful dad. I discovered my first nuthatch nest in summer 2014. It belonged to my first nuthatch pair, Nutty and Hatch. At the time, though, they did not feed from my hand, but I had already known them since winter that year, and I'm pretty sure they were familiar with me. Nutty was an amazing mom. Only females incubate the eggs, and when they hatch, the female broods them as well, which means they spend a lot of time caring for their young. But she also brought just as much food to her babies as Hatch did. I found the babies one of the most sweetest and funny too. Once they were only a few days from fledging, they would fight to look out of the hole, calling endlessly to their parents for food. The neatest thing happened on the day of fledging too. To encourage their babies to fledge, Nutty and Hatch stopped bringing them food as often and didn't hang around the nest, but kept within an earshot away. While they were calling to their parents, a black and white warbler passed through and stopped by their nest. The babies didn't know better and begged to be fed by the warbler. The warbler didn't seem to know what to do, but after much thought it left. On the way back though, it stopped by again and this time with a caterpillar. The babies went nuts. I think the warbler's strong need to care for its own young was making it difficult to snap out of it. It didn't know what to do, I don't think. That's a fun bird watching moment for me. Not long after it left, Hatch brought a little bit of food and then the first one fledged. Nutty and Hatch divided up the young and brought them around the territory for the next month. Nutty was a wonderful devoted mom. A beautiful experience watching these guys. For bathroom motors that linger, try Febreze Small Spaces. Just press firmly and it continuously eliminates odors in the air and on soft surfaces for 45 days. Anyone that knows me knew I was going to save a blue jay nest for last. Blue and Sweet Girl was my second blue jay nest, but really I consider it my first one because the other one was from another pair that failed very early on. I found Blue and Sweet Girl's nest in 2014. I was so happy. Because Blue and Sweet Girl trusted and knew me so well by that point, they were perfectly fine with me and would even come to me when they wanted a peanut. The teamwork that goes into this is heartwarming. The male and female builds the nest, but only the female incubates the eggs and broods the young after they hatch. During this time, the male provides all of the food for the female and the nestlings. This doesn't mean that females get an easy job, though. Sweet Girl didn't get to just sit up in the nest all day doing nothing. She had to keep the nest clean as well as the nestlings.
and she even had to keep a lookout for any dangers, like squirrels. Those guys can be unrelenting, but Sweet Girl was quite good at getting rid of them. She may not feed them as much in the beginning, but as they get bigger, she has to chip in and provide some food for them. So she has to protect her babies, groom them, keep the nest clear of parasites, and gather food. The level of attention and care a Blue Jay pair puts into raising their offspring is quite touching and amazing to watch. And the babies are super adorable and sweet. Truly my favorite nest to watch. I know I said that was the last one, but here's a bonus just because it was my first nest. Gray Jays, also known as Canada Jay. Unfortunately, the nest wasn't successful. They got pretty far though. The thing that amazed me the most is the fact that they nest earlier than most birds when there is still snow on the ground around middle to late March and early April. This means snowstorms. To see Gray, the female I knew at the time, nestled in that nest and all covered in snow, and it was cold too, was touching to say the least. What a devoted mom. So that's a few of my favorite or most memorable experiences watching birds nesting. What one did you like the most? And have you ever watched a bird nesting before? Comment below and let me know. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you next week. Happy birding.